One of the hardest things uh, to do when we're talking about uh, the events of 9-11 is that it was such a huge, complex event. There's so many things happening. Everybody can see their anomalies. You know, things happened and you know that shouldn't have happened, this shouldn't have happened, and so forth. Why did the buildings come down? Why weren't the planes intercepted? How did the hijackers uh, manage to do what they did, and so forth? One of the problems uh, with trying to cover the whole waterfront in discussing 9-11 is that uh, how strongly we are certain of various elements, uh, it varies a lot. Like what happened at the Pentagon, what happened out in Pennsylvania where the plane went down, what happened at the World Trade Center. Um, I've come to believe that what we really need to do is to uh, focus on the elements of the um, events of 9-11 that have been the most strongly analyzed and established so that we know what happened and we know that the official story is a fabrication at that stage. Okay, I've come up with, uh, I'd, I'd call it three plus one. There's three main points that I think uh, if you focus on these, I think you can establish really beyond doubt that 9-11 uh, had to have been orchestrated with insider complicity that goes uh, very broadly in the U.S. intelligence services and military industrial complex, something like that. There had to have been connections at that kind of a level. But we don't start there. We're starting with hard, um, hard evidence. The first is the dynamics of the way the buildings came down. We have good uh, material about that. The second is the fires and the temperatures that were achieved in these fires. And the third is the fact that we've actually found uh, remnants of a material called nanothermite uh, in the dust. These, I think, are the strongest case that we have that something very sinister is going on in 9-11 it's not something that was um, just a, uh, an outside uh, attack from Arabs or Afghans or anybody else who you want to think was involved here. I say three plus one. The other element is the cover-up. Probably as strong as any of the main lines of evidence is evidence of a cover-up. And when there's a cover-up, it's, in my mind, that's strong evidence that there's something somebody wants covered up. And so I'd like to go back and focus on, in terms of what, are, what do we know on each of these grounds. I think it's important that we start at a very intuitive level, just looking at the event. Let's look at the North Tower, which was the, the one that uh, was the best photographed of the towers. At this point, the South Tower had already collapsed. Uh, the North Tower was the first one hit by a plane, but it was the second one to come down. All these cameras were looking at it, and we have um, a good uh, footage. Plus, it came down essentially um, straight down. There was a little bit of tipping, but it was essentially a straight down collapse. And what we see when the North Tower is coming down is along the edge of the building, you can see jets being uh, expelled very violently. Um, these are um, clearly explosions. The, the speed of the collapse, the, the breadth of the expansion of the debris, and um, the, the degree of pulverization are all indications that something very energetic is going on here. It's difficult to to take concrete and reduce it to powder. Uh, because every time, if you think of it, if you break a rock, you had to create a new surface. And so it takes energy to pull that rock apart. And then you break it apart again. Each time it is subdivided smaller and smaller, it takes an additional input of energy. So to reduce this down to uh, micron-sized powder uh, takes a lot of energy. The dust cloud was not generated when the concrete hit the ground and fragmented and produced dust. This was dust before it ever hit the ground. There's very little concrete in the actual rubble pile. 
what we see in the rubble pile is steel and the concrete has been spread all over Manhattan. I personally did uh, some analysis of, the, of the, the collapse of the North Tower during the time when the, the, the roof line was visible before it descended into the dust cloud. This tower had perimeter columns around the outer walls. It also had a core structure around the elevator shafts and so forth with 47 very massive uh, core columns. The, the, there was a mast on top, it's a television antenna, on top of the North Tower. And at the very onset of collapse, the very first motion you can see is this descending. It wasn't down here where the break occurred. It wasn't as though the top section was starting to come down. What was happening was the top of the building was coming down before the, the break point, if that's what it was, uh, even began. So you see a crushing of the top section of the building. And the, the, the tower was directly supported over these core columns. So if you have 47 core columns and you take the, the roof line, which is coming straight down, that has to be that those core columns were basically eliminated. Uh, they had to have been removed suddenly and completely for the building to do that. The speed with which this came down, the technical term is the acceleration. It turns out that the, 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 the descent of the tower uh, was not at a constant speed. It was picking up speed as it went, and that's called acceleration. If you graph the descent of the North Tower, you can actually see that it accelerated all the way the entire time that the roof line is visible. Now that's very significant. For something to be accelerating downward, it means the net force acting on it is downward. Okay. Now there's two forces at work here. There's gravity and there's the resistance. And if the net force is downward, it means the resistance is less than gravity because the net force has to dominate downward. Therefore, it tells us that the resistive force was less than the weight of the block. But here you have this block continuing to pick up speed. It's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And the only way that can happen is to say, it is not crushing the bottom section of the building. The bottom section is being removed to allow this to fall into oblivion. This is falling into the, the, the hole, basically, that's been opened up for it. The rate of fall is not free fall. That's, um, you might have heard that occasionally. A lot of people talk about how it's free fall or close to free fall. Yeah, it's two thirds of free fall if you actually measure it. It's falling at two thirds of the acceleration of gravity. So the North Tower, we have this situation where we can clearly show that the support has been removed, allowing this to fall in the manner that it's observed. There was a third building of the World Trade Center complex that suffered a total um, catastrophic collapse on the same day. It came down at 520 that evening, and it was across the street from the North Tower, and it's about half the height of the Twin Towers. It came down at absolute free fall for the first hundred feet or so of its collapse, all right? So uh, to have a building come down in absolute free fall means all resistance has been removed, okay? How do we know it's absolute free fall? We can measure it. The government agency that, um, that conducted the official investigation is called NIST, National Institute for Standards and Technology. It used to be called the National Bureau of Standards. This is not really a forensic investigation, and they're not empowered to do an, a forensic investigation. This was a building safety investigation is what it was. And, but NIST came out with this report. In the draft report in August of 2008, uh, which was actually the final draft uh, apart from public comment, they 
presented uh, a report that claimed the Building 7 came down at 40% slower than freefall. The simplest observation of the motion shows that it's, it's very close to freefall. And if you do a detailed analysis of the motion, you can see that it's coming at absolute freefall. I had an opportunity to challenge NIST on this and other people as well. It wasn't me by myself, but there was a number of us who um, put in what was called a request for correction. And I was able to ask a question at their technical briefing. And what it comes down to is NIST fumbled the ball. And they, uh, so they actually, in their final report, went back and changed the report to acknowledge freefall. So in the final NIST report, they literally acknowledged that the building was in free fall. By their measurement, it was two and a quarter seconds. And uh, so this free fall has tremendous implications, and yet they simply waved their hands and said, it's consistent with our analysis. It's completely false. It's a completely bogus analysis, uh, uh, but that's the way it was. So, what we see by the fact that NIST is trying to obscure the significance of this finding uh, is we see a government agency trying to whitewash uh, the situation here. I think the second uh, main point I want to make is that there were temperatures in the towers during this whole collapse event that uh, were far higher than could possibly have been achieved uh, by normal methods. In other words, if you take office furnishings, just a regular fire, and you throw in kerosene, and you say, how hot could this burn? Could that weaken the steel? Could that allow this building to collapse? At first, the storyline, the official story, was that the, the, because of the jet fuel, it was so hot that it melted the steel and so forth. Well, that didn't stand up very long. It was very quickly uh, shown that kerosene, which is essentially, jet fuel is essentially kerosene, this kerosene couldn't possibly get to a temperature where you would melt steel. The maximum temperature for uh, a hydrocarbon fire, that's basically ordinary organic materials, whether it's kerosene, hydrocarbons like that, or whether it's paper and things that you'd find in offices, the maximum temperature would be about 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature it takes to melt steel is around 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. So in other words, it's, we're missing the temperature needed to melt the steel by 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is something that you can't just wave your hands. So the government story changed at this point. Um, rather than asserting that the, the steel melted, it was simply asserted that uh, it was weakened. Okay, so if you take the temperatures achievable in these fires, uh, all you have to get is around 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit for it to weaken the steel uh, to half of its initial strength. Um, even so, and, and yes, you could get to those temperatures under ideal conditions, but even so, experiments uh, with actual physical structures show that if you take a steel framed structure, uh, it doesn't collapse. There's another side of the story as well. Uh, it's very clear that the temperatures needed to melt steel were actually achieved. Okay, One of the main uh, pieces of evidence for this is that there is iron found in the dust. There are droplets of iron. These iron droplets, uh, the, the fact that they're droplets indicates it was melted in an environment where it was then sprayed. So it's like in an explosion. Uh, there's something that's hot enough to melt the iron and, and spray it around. Secondly, it does not have the chemical, com, uh, chemical signature of structural steel. This is iron. It's from a different source. The most likely source for this iron is there is a, a kind of material used as an incendiary. It's not normally thought of as an explosive. Uh, but it's uh, thermite, and thermite has, starts off with iron oxide and aluminum, and during the reaction, what you have is the oxygen jumps from the iron over to the aluminum. The aluminum is more attractive to the 
oxygen than iron is. And when it, when it jumps, it liberates a lot of energy in the form of high temperature, and the iron comes out as molten iron. The aluminum comes out as aluminum oxide, which is like a white powdery substance. It's a smoke. And so what we see is white smoke and iron droplets. And uh, these droplets, if you take ordinary thermite in a lab, you can uh, react it, you'll get little iron spheres that result. What you see in the dust from the World Trade Center are iron spheres scattered all through the dust. And every sample of dust that's been taken is just absolutely jam-packed with these iron spheres. So right there, it's a signature that the temperatures needed, the 2700 degree temperatures had to have been achieved uh, to make those iron spheres. So the fact that these iron spheres exist is a uh, very solid scientific proof that high temperatures were achieved. Uh, it goes beyond that. There's observations of iron or molten iron, molten steel, whichever, in the rubble pile. There's actual photographs of uh, either iron or steel pouring out of the South Tower just before it collapsed. Uh, so there's all of these uh, converging lines of evidence that these high temperatures were in fact achieved. There's a very good paper on this in the Journal of 9-11 Studies, and um, I encourage you, you can find that online and uh, look this paper up. One of the things that happened during the research uh, looking at these iron spheres in the dust. Um, Stephen Jones is one of the central figures in this uh, investigation, uh, but he ran across lots of little red flakes in the dust. And these are brilliant red, and in fact they're red on one side and gray on the other, little chips. And these uh, would really catch your eye. Uh, but he spent um, over a year, I believe, actually investigating these, and other people were brought into this investigation. There was eventually a paper that was uh, published about this uh, in the Open Chemical Physics Journal, and it was on um, uh, evidence of um, thermitic materials in the World Trade Center dust. Um, let me describe this a little bit. Ordinary thermite uh, is something that burns very hot. Uh, I was telling you how iron melts at like 2,700 degrees. Uh, thermite, burning thermite is up around 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, way higher than needed for this, um, for melting of iron, okay? Um, ordinary thermite is not an explosive. It just is sort of like it, was used, it used to be used for welding uh, railroad tracks, for instance, and so it's like something that burns very hot. Um, however, there are new technologies that use the thermitic reaction in different ways. If you take the component particles that make up the thermite and you, you make smaller particles, it gives more surface, uh, total surface available, and the reaction goes faster, and it can uh, actually get up to, to um, a reaction speed that approaches uh, what you would think of as a high explosive. This is not a, tr a traditional high explosive. And by uh, tailoring the way this is manufactured, you can take tiny, tiny particles of this stuff, and uh, you can tailor it to go faster or slower. And if you add in, um, hydrocarbons, which the idea of an explosive is you're going to have a material which has rapid expansion. So there's a pressure wave or a shock wave that comes out that uh, creates pressure that can uh, break things and so forth. All right. And so one thing is to get it hot. Secondly is to get it hot very quickly. And the third thing is to have something that expands and is able to um, uh, fracture things um, in the expansion to create an explosive. Um, this kind of thermite with these tiny particles is called nanothermite, and in order to get these particles, it's not a matter of taking iron oxide and breaking it down, it's a matter of building up the components from the atom scale upward. So in other words, you use technology that you can fabricate it 
at the molecular level and you basically create nano-sized particles. These are like a hundred times smaller than a human red blood cell. So very, very tiny particles in very close association. And what we find in these red-gray chips is in this red layer, you have the iron oxide and you have the aluminum and they are intermingled in very close proximity and it's into a, a medium which once heated can ex, um, be vaporized and expand so it can actually act like an explosive. So what we see is nanothermite has been demonstrated to be present in the dust. This paper is, it was an explosive paper, or should have been in, a, in the symbolic sense of the word here. This should have been the, the coup de grace to this whole discussion, but it is uh, widely ignored. They say, well, it wasn't one of the primary journals. Why was it in this little side level journal here? The whole idea in science is you want to get your results published to where other scientists can check what you've said, critique what you've said, and it's a process of openness and interchange of ideas so that uh, it can become self-correcting. The bottom line is though, this paper has been published, the research has been done, and it has not been substantively um, critiqued. The validity of this, of course, is as, is as open to um, correction and critique as any other finding in science, but it's out there and it's something that can't simply be brushed aside. By the way, the, st the steel, which would seem to be part of any forensic investigation, the site was cleaned up and the steel was cut up and melted down. Very few pieces were saved by NIST uh, and cataloged uh, for future study. We have uh, three very um, uh, clear, very solidly established pieces of scientific evidence. We have the dynamics of the building collapses, we have the high temperatures and the, the very strong evidence for these high temperatures, and we have the presence in the dust of um, thermitic materials. The other uh, thing that's observable and is as clear as any of these is the existence of a cover-up. The Bush administration did not want to do an investigation of 9-11 at all. It took the family members of 9-11 um, uh, victims over a year to get uh, the 9-11 commission uh, authorized. And so here was this rushed investigation. It was all political. The 9-11 commission was governed by uh, a White House insider. So even though it appeared to be balanced in terms of Democrats, Democrats and Republicans on the committee, it was the person managing the whole thing uh, that pulled it together uh, who was basically a spokesperson for the White House. They did a consensus, uh, they had a, a consensus policy. So anything where there was disagreement, they left it out. So any, anything in the whole 9-11 incident which uh, one side or the other of this argument uh, objected to, it was, it was not included. So we have the 9-11 Commission which then produced a very hollow report which did not grapple with um, uh, the facts of the matter. Then we had the NIST investigation. NIST is not a forensic investigation arm of the government. It's, uh, it's part of the Department of Commerce. And in, in the, if you read the beginning of the NIST report, it explicitly says how nothing uh, in a NIST investigation can be used um, to litigate anything with, against anybody. It was explicitly not looking for uh, the perpetrators of any kind of a crime. It was a building safety investigation. They very intentionally sidestepped any dealing with anything that they might consider controversial in this. They limited the scope to the onset of collapse. They just blithely assumed as soon as you can account for where a collapse might begin, it was just assumed that it would continue 
and it would go all the way through. Um, in other words, they did not investigate the collapses. They looked at the planes, the crashes, they looked for weakening of steel, they looked a little of this, little of that, but they did not actually investigate what happens to a building as it's collapsing. Will it all go all the way down or will it collapse a few floors and stop, for instance? This wasn't covered. So the kinds of things that you actually see happening during the collapse are left totally without comment. We don't need to go through and answer every little question about the entire events of the day. We know right away that something is going on. It had to have had uh, very high level insider collaboration at the very least. So if Building 7 came down uh, in a demolition, and if that happened the same day as the towers coming down, all of this had to have been coordinated. I would call it an operation. I'll leave it at that and say there's something going on here that needs to be looked at, taken very seriously, and it can't just simply be brushed aside.